Hi, this is Synth Chaser from SynthChaser.com. I hope your new year's off to a great start. I thought we'd start things off this year on the channel by fixing a problem on this ARP Pro DGX. This revision of the Pro DGX is basically the same as the ARP Pro Soloist, just with push button switches for the voice selection instead of toggle switches. This Pro DGX powers up and the voice selection switches seem to work, but there's no output. Here I've got it flipped over for troubleshooting. Normally I'd have it standing up on its side, but this video is in landscape format, so having the synth oriented this way will be better for you guys to see. So looking around inside, we can see that someone's already recapped the synthesizer with my capacitor kit, with the exception of this capacitor here under the key bed. I tend to recommend against replacing this capacitor, and I'll come back to the reasons why in just a bit. So they had recapped the keyboard hoping to fix this no audio output problem, but the problem remained after the recap. I have at least one, but probably multiple videos where I show how to troubleshoot dead presets on these synthesizers. Even though all the presets are dead on this one, I approached it the same way. So I picked the bassoon preset, and using the voice flowchart in the service manual, I started following the signal flow along. Basically, this flowchart shows how the signal is routed and what waveforms you should be looking at at various points along in the signal path. So I worked my way down to the output of the VCF. So here I've got my scope probe clipped onto the output of the uh, 4034 VCF module. And the output that I see on my oscilloscope, it was there, and it pretty much matches what the, uh, the service manual shows that we should be looking for. So it was at this point that I noticed that if I if I press the key on the key bed, the pitch isn't changing. The frequency of that VCF output is staying the same no matter what key I press. So I was like, huh, I wonder if there's a problem with the keyboard scanning circuitry. So I took a look at this board. It's board E and it's mounted to the bottom of the key bed. This board scans the key bed and generates a gate a trigger, a two-bit digital code to indicate the octave of the active key, and a four-bit digital code to indicate the note of the active key. These digital codes are then decoded on board A over here to set the pitch of a high-frequency VCO and the rank of the octave dividers that are used to make the sound that you hear. Anyway, the functionality on this board, gate, trigger, and active note, is pretty simple and could be done on a single chip today. But this design's from 1972, and this was done without a microprocessor, microcontroller, instead with a bunch of TTL chips, as we see here. So I want to look at the gate, which we can see on the schematic is on pin 6 of connector P4, but we're on the wrong side of the board to probe that guy. So instead what we'll do is we'll follow this down. over here to uh, pin 9 of Z9, and that's where we'll probe. So as we can see, I can press some keys, and there's no gate signal. So with no gate signal coming off this board, you're not going to hear anything from the synthesizer. So the way this board works is there's a high-frequency clock oscillator here that runs around 100 kilohertz. That 100 kilohertz is then divided down six times, one, two, three, four, five, six, by these two chips, Z4 and Z5, and it cycles through that, basically making a six-bit code that just cycles forever. Four of these bits, these four, are used by this multiplexer chip to select the J wires that correspond to a given note. So when the four bits are uh, 0, 0, 1, 0, for example, all the J wires for the D keys will be connected to the output pin on this multiplexer. The other two bits of that six-digit code are generated by this dual flip-flop chip. The two-bit octave code has four different combinations, and these logic gates demultiplex that. So as these two bits cycle through their combinations, each of the four bus bars will be cycled through becoming active. So when a bus bar is activated, and a J wire is touching it, we'll see some output on this pin of this multiplexer chip. And when there's output on this pin, we know what key corresponds to it because at that instant, 
the frequency dividers are holding the six digit code for that note and octave. So around that is built the functionality to generate a gate when a key is pressed, a trigger when a note changes. And since that six bit frequency divider is always cycling, there's some logic to uh, latch these and hold the code uh, of the note that's being pressed. So now that we know how this board works, I'll explain what I found. The high frequency clock oscillator was running just fine, as well as all six stages of the frequency dividers. However, when I probe the bus bars, I could see that they're never being activated. So then I had a look at these logic gates. This chip's a 7403. It's a quad NAND gate chip with open collector outputs. So let's pick one of these gates, uh, this one here, and we'll confirm that the inputs are there on pins one and two, and then we'll look at the output on pin three. So here on pin one, we have a three kilohertz square wave. On the other input, pin two, we have a 1.5 kilohertz square wave. And on the output, pin three, we're uh, flat at zero volts. So a NAND gate is only low when both of its inputs are high. And we saw that neither of the two inputs are high all the time, so we should expect to see the output uh, high at least some of the time. This chip has open collector outputs, so just to be sure that the problem is with the chip, we can pull the output up to 5 volts through a pull-up resistor. If something downstream is pulling that open collector output to ground, it should be doing it when we try to pull the output up. So I've selected a really weak pull-up resistor. This is a 100K resistor, and I've precariously clipped it here onto my 5-volt rail, and I am going to touch it to the output pin of that NAND gate. And I've got the scope connected to it. So we can see that uh, the output is a constant 5 volts. So the output of that gate is never changing and it looks like the chip is dead. So I'm going to look at this chip one more way to be sure it's really dead. I've got a thermal camera here. I'm covering up the name and model of the camera because it's a piece of crap that broke and the company didn't stand behind their product. So I don't want any of you to waste your money on it. But these TTL chips eat power to run. And the power is dissipated as heat, which we'll be able to see with a thermal camera. And these are really old TTL chips. They're not even LS series chips. So they're really power hungry little guys and they should be warm. Hopefully I can show you without the glare from the overhead lights. So as we go along this, uh, this row of chips, we see heat coming from them with the exception, with the exception of this one that we're clipped onto. This one has a little bit of heat and then these have significant amounts of heat. But uh, this one here, our suspect chip, is uh, stone cold dead, and it's gonna need to be replaced. So from looking at it a few different ways, we're pretty sure that this chip is bad. Why am I looking at it from so many ways? Why not just try replacing this chip? And it's because this circuit board is an absolute pain in the ass to remove and work on. The easy part of it is to remove these two connectors, although for this one down here, you need to release this board B from its plastic standoffs, otherwise you'll probably damage the delicate pins of the ribbon cable getting it out or getting it back in. But then you've got to decouple all the J-wires from the keys, so all these little nylon cups or J-wire guides need to come off, and you've got to desolder the uh, these wires that come from the circuit board and go to each of the four different uh, bus bars. There's one, two, three, four, and yes, you can see there that there's a little bus bar that just has one, one key touching it. You can see these wires came from the factory with cold, crappy solder joints, so maybe it's not a terrible thing that we need to uh, remove this board and, and re-solder it when we put it back in. Then we have to release the board from these plastic standoffs that hold it to the bottom of the key bed. These are usually brittle from being 45 to 50 years old, and if they're not broken already, they often break when trying to remove the board. So 
knowing what a pain in the butt it would be to replace the chips on this board, all this hassle could have been avoided if ARP had spent a few extra pennies and used IC sockets for these chips on this board. But say lovey. So this is the reason why I recommend leaving this one tantalum capacitor. I've never seen this particular one fail and generally more harm than good can come from trying to replace it. But since I need to take this board out, I'm going to use it as an opportunity to replace the capacitor and clean the J wires and the bus bars. So I mentioned the uh, cold solder joints on the bus bar wires and uh, I did a close-up of this one. Well, I barely touched the thing with my soldering iron and the, the, the whole solder joint just cracked off that little thing tab that it amounts to. So uh, this was, was never soldered well. So I wound up pulling the key bed and disassembling it entirely. And that totally isn't necessary to change this chip. To, do, to change a chip, you only need to remove the circuit board and the little J-wire guides. But uh, what I noticed was the bushings were super hard and I wanted to replace them. I took a measurement of the, the touch sensor and found the touch sensor was weak. And I mentioned earlier the, the bus bars and the, uh, the J-wires were really filthy. So just pulling the key bed, disassembling it, uh, will give me an opportunity to address all that stuff. I can clean the keys, clean the, the contacts, replace the bushings, replace the touch sensor, recap this capacitor, and change this chip all in one fell swoop. And then the, the key bed will, will be like new. So I've replaced the chip and I've put it in an IC socket. So in case it fails again, the next person that, that goes to repair it doesn't have to go through the hassle that I did of removing uh, this board. And I took a look and the bus bars are being activated now. The note code is being generated, octave code, and the gate and the trigger, they're all, they're all there. We can take a look. I'll, we'll look at the, the gate signal. So that was um, pin 9 of Z9. This with one hand holding the keyboard up like this and we'll press a key and on the scope there we can see the uh, the gate signal goes high when I'm holding a key down so uh, I think we've re repaired this board we can flip it over and see if, if we we get any sound now and now we can hear some output from the synthesizer. I still need to go through and make sure everything is working but we fixed the problem that we set out to fix. Hopefully you found this helpful, or at least interesting. If you've got a broken ARP and need parts for it, be sure to check out my website. If you've got a broken ARP and need someone to repair it, I'm your guy. I'm SynthChaser from SynthChaser.com. Thanks for watching, and have a great day.